scripture reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1-4. through 4. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? Good morning! So I love symbols. Like, I don't know what it is. Whether it's the cross, whether it's, you know, the fish symbol, whether it's communion. There's something about symbols that make things easier to remember. I always like the Old Testament because when you're in the Old Testament... You've always got symbols. No matter what you're celebrating, it's so you could remember something. Whether you're having a feast so you can remember Passover, or whether you're having a day of fasting so you can remember that we are sinful and need sacrifice, or the fact that God in all his understanding commanded communion to be perpetual. Commanded it to continue we know that in the scriptures, there are certain symbols that should mean a lot to us. Christ, when he went in to celebrate this Passover, did something that was very unusual. He was the teacher, so therefore all of his students should have served him. But instead of doing it proper and getting things done in that normal way, what did he do? He went in and he took a towel. He wrapped it around his waist and he washed the disciples' feet. Now today we're going to talk about something that doesn't fit in our context, and that's bad. It is bad that this doesn't apply more. I, I called my dad up, he's a lawyer, and I was like, well, could this work in modern day? And he goes, as good as any court could. He goes, you could really have a problem with your brother, and you could go one-on-one -on -one and go talk to your brother about it, and then say, okay, let's go to some godly men, let's take the elders. And let's go before them and see if they decide the issue. He goes, it would work as good as any court in the U.S. And what he meant by that is there's always a higher court to fix the problems. What he was saying was that if you went to a lower court, all most people would do if they got a decision they didn't like, go to the next court. Go to the appellate court. And then finally we have the Supreme Court. And the only time that people ever go, okay, there is no more hope I've given up is once they've got to the Supreme Court. And in this passage, what it's saying is, if I have a dispute with you, could I not go before the elders and, you know, have them decide the issue? And the truth is, no. Because, you know, there's one thing that, one symbol that we're missing here. There's one symbol in this story that we're not getting. We're servants. We're completely missing this servant attitude. Because... It, this is how it works in church. You don't have servants, you have volunteers. And if you had servants, this is how it would work. You would have, I would have a dispute with you. We would take it before the elders. They would settle it. That would be finished. But this is how it works in our modern churches. We take it before the elders. They side with you. See y'all. How many of y'all seen it? Somebody gets upset, doesn't get their way. And instead of going, well, you know, you're godly men, righteous men, and we've appointed you. And then you give us a decision, and we have no scripture to go against you, and we don't like it. That's not a servant attitude. And that's what I asked him about. I said, how could you make this work? You know, could we put in a crazy contract that said, you know, if we have a problem in the church, we would go before the elders. He said, the problem is that people who don't consider themselves servants will consider themselves masters. They will consider themselves, oh, I didn't get what I wanted. And me as master, I'm going to go somewhere else so I can get the answer I wanted. I'm going to go and I'm going to find, I don't care who they are. If I have to go to the Gentiles, if I have to go to the ungodly, if I have to go to a civil court, I will. Because I am the master. And this is not fitting for any of this scripture. Starting in verse 5. He's going to give them a little holy beat down right here. And here it is. I say this to your shame. 
Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren? But brother goes to law before brother, and that before unbelievers? Actually, then it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor Ephemite, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Now think about it. He's saying this. He said, I thought you left all this stuff behind. I thought this wickedness was put behind you, but now you, you're convinced that you're the master. You have no image of Christ washing feet. You have an image of Christ washing your feet. You have this idea where it comes down to and it says, there were all these sins in your life, and that's how you were. You put them away from you. But now you're fighting to be on top. You're convinced when somebody disagrees with you, you've got to make sure that that wrong is settled. You've got to make sure that you prove that they're the wrong ones. In this, what it happens is he's mocking them. He says, is there not anybody wise among you? Is there nobody in the whole church who can figure stuff out? And he's mocking them. He's saying, how do you not realize that you will judge the world? And yet, when it comes to matters between brothers, uh, you know, let's take it before the civil court. Let's take it before those who have the most power. You know, let's, let's say that my issue is so important that I'm going to fight until I win. And usually I love to tell you how a verse applies perfectly in our society. How we're just like Corinth and it will work. And you know what? We're not like Corinth. Usually we're slightly more moral. Right now we're not. We are the most litigious society I can name. We love lawsuits. Everybody loves a good lawsuit. Why, why are there so many lawyers in America? Because they're needed. Because everybody goes, I have a problem with you. And instead of going, you know, you're a mutual party. Can I come before you, present my problem? Let's work it out. Let's, let's work it out. No, we have this win. You don't go to court and think, oh, okay, I'm going to go to court. And, you know, they'll settle it out and then we'll be best friends. You go to court so you can be heard. So you can win. So you can have that voice. And most people are struck by how terrible courts are. The whole point of a court is you're going to go in there and present your case. They're going to go in there and present the case. The lawyer's job is to make you look bad. If they don't, they're bad lawyers. They're going in there trying to prove that you are a bad person, that you, your claim is worthless, and that whatever their client says is so much better. That fits America pretty well. That fits our concept of Many people's idea of even church. And that's what's said. So many people have this idea of church that fits that. In which not only do I want to win, I need you to look bad. I need you. I'm going to use the word that I love to use because it's the meanest word we have. They're a heretic. I, I, if you wanted to get somebody killed in the Middle Ages, call them a heretic. That was the idea. Heretic was that word that we kept in our pocket, and it was, I disagree with you, you're a heretic. And they used it. And what happened? You had persecution after persecution. Bloody Mary. Oh, people disagreed with her, must be heretics. The Inquisition, people disagreed with them, must be heretics. And it no longer became the servant attitude. But he con continues with this servant attitude in verse 12. He said, all things are lawful for me. But not all things are profitable. 
All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach. The stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall we then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. I used a word earlier that I like, servant. The problem is we don't get it. Because we have a servant attitude, and sometimes we think of servant, and we put in the word volunteer, and it flows back and forth for us. Let's work with a word we're, we're pretty good with, slave. It doesn't say, I'd hired you at a wage. It doesn't. It says, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. It's not the image of a servant. It's the image, not the image of a worker. That's an, not an employee. That's the image of a Christ who set an example and said, you will be the slaves. You will serve the world. And you will be treated as nothing. You will be despised and rejected. And he says, you are not your own. Do you imagine if we all decided to be slaves? We decided that it wasn't going to be up to us what we do, but we're going to say, God, what is your will? That's what I'm going to do. And then we would seek to figure out what it is and say, I've already agreed to do it. And it didn't go, well, I've got 500 excuses. You do. And if you need one more, you can probably make up one more. But if we decided that we were a body and that we had godly men who tried to lead us and they followed the word and they did what they were supposed to and we said we were going to serve. We're going to be slaves of Christ. We're going to seek to do God's will and it's going to be the God who gets to be God going to be him who gets to be the master. And our lives would not be ruled by our own reason or our own desires. He goes back to this. Look what he's talking about. He's saying, why don't you compare this to being joined to God? Spiritual marriage with God. The other one, this fleshly marriage with sin. And he says, your members are that of Christ. My hand has never done anything I didn't want it to do. My hand doesn't wake up in the morning and slap me just because it doesn't like my face. I, uh, if it did, y'all would admit that I'm crazy finally. But the thing is, my hand doesn't do that. I don't slap my face just because my hand wanted to. You chose to do that, Caleb. The choice is, if my hand slaps my face, I chose it, right? And too often we get this concept of a body that is us. But a body without a head is just a corpse. It just sits there, does nothing. And when we say that the body has a head, the head of the body is Christ, and we are just members of that body. And we get out all these ideas that any time we get upset, we've been wronged. Be wronged. Let's go back to the beginning. Be wronged. Be defrauded. Be cheated. Be that mat that everybody walks on. Be trampled underfoot. Be like Jesus. Right? Was Jesus wronged? He had done nothing wrong but suffered as a sinner. Was he defrauded? He is God. In the flesh. And he is treated as the lowest human. 
Was he cheated? He allowed himself to suffer at the hands of evil men. We've got pretty imagery of Christ. We do. But until you start in the beginning, with Christ being a servant, our whole concept of everything is, has to change. How many of us honestly look at our day and say, God, I want to be a servant? You know, you get up in the morning, you grab your towel, right? You grab your towel, you wrap it around your waist, and you go out to serve. You, you may have things to do in the day, but your goal, your emphasis at the end of the day is that you are going to serve during the day. You're going to make God such a priority that it doesn't become, I have a question if I'm going to do this for God. It goes, I'm going to do this for God. What's he want? What does he want me to do? And I'm actually looking to be used by God. We, we go back to a phrase, and there is a phrase that we overuse. Jesus is Lord. Lord, Master. That makes us slave and servant. First Corinthians spends a lot of time talking about division. Now, if we are wronged and defrauded, there's not a lot of division. If I'm not worried about always being proven right, there's not a lot of division. If I'm not worried about making sure you look as bad as possible for you disagreeing with me, there is not a lot of division. There's division that comes because people act contrary to the word. But most division has nothing to do with that. Most division has to do with the fact that I'm not willing to be wrong. Me, me and my wife are different enough that, that I, I learn a lot from her. She's actually very traditional. I'm very Bible only. I don't really care. I don't. It doesn't fit as good is traditional. She has one word, I have like 15. Bible only, I don't care. It sounds the same. But we, but we have these different things. And here's the question. We will admit that, you know, uh, we, we don't have to have everything perfect. There are things we disagree about. Okay. There are times when my opinion is different than her opinion. Okay. And that's the idea of being a servant. Is that when we come, we say that one, it's okay for righteous men to lead us. It's okay for righteous men to make decisions on opinions. And you know what? I may disagree, but it doesn't matter. I'm allowed to disagree, but I don't need to seek my own. I don't need to instantly go back into this way of, Everything's about me. Let me go back to this sinful, fleshly idea and go, well, I didn't get my way here. I'm just going over here. I, I didn't get my way from this person. I'm going to go talk to this person. M my dad doesn't like the church, by the way. I want you to know that. He doesn't like the church. He thinks it's very corrupt, very evil, very twisted. I consulted him only for legal advice, and he gave me a lot more than I asked for. He said, you, you know what all that's going to happen is? You're going to do that, and somebody will get upset and leave. I was like, well, that wouldn't always happen. He goes, well, and he started down the list of things that happened as a kid. He goes, you remember when you were at Emmanuel? Yeah, remember when they split? Uh, yeah. That was carpet. You remember when you were at the Methodist? Yeah. You remember when they split? No, I was too young. He goes, that was because they were wearing the wrong color in the choir. I was like, this is a joke, right? He's like, no, you just don't remember. And how bad is it for somebody looking outside going, those are not servants. Those are not servants at all. Those are people seeking their own way. I know who their God is. 
I should be able to walk in this room and tell you who our God is and say, our God is very clear. We all agree upon this. We have one God, one master, and I can't. It is impossible for me to walk into a room and say that I know who our God is. Because based on our behaviors, is our God really God? Or does he kind of share with us? One of those, you, you, you've commanded this, right now I'm not feeling it. And when people come to the church, they should be able to find something. They should be able to find a group of people who agree that he is God. That's it. Who should be able to agree that when we disagree, that's petty and pointless because my hands don't attack each other either. I don't slap Jesus in the face, but I don't slap my other hand. I don't just start punching myself in the rib cage because it's fun. Because he presents something. You can either have this sinful way that you were rescued from and take it back. Or you can have Jesus as Lord submit to godly men and let them settle our issues. And be unified in the way that only the perfect church can be unified. In a way that only the Spirit and Christ can do. A unity that is impossible anywhere else. But that only works if he's God. Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. And he said to them, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. It only works if he's God. And the first step in that is admitting that he is God. Having heard of Christ, believing that he is the Christ, confessing Jesus as Lord, repenting of your sins, being buried in submission to him in the watery baptism so that you can live your life of service to him. So that one day you get to be with him or be condemned. Or if there's anybody who has said in their life and they need prayers of the church or if there's anybody who just needs prayers because they have needs or if there's anybody who wants to submit to the leadership here in the same spirit we've talked about today we ask that you come now as we stand and as we sing